let me speak about a few items today and a few items tomorrow that I hope will help you in managing retina. And I'm going to discuss a lot of clinical trials in three of my subsequent talks. And those give us evidence that may or may not work within the programs that you work at. But it's important first to understand what the results are and what the science is. And then you take that and apply it to your particular practice, your particular limitations that you may have because of the patients or the logistics or the economics. But if you don't necessarily understand the results of the trials, then it's hard to know what data to put into your decision making. So I want to talk for this first hour or so, but that's with interruptions and with your helping me. Uh, I want to talk about what I think about when we're interpreting clinical trials in the literature. And then we're going to look at clinical trials after that. The first one will be in macular degeneration. And then tomorrow morning we'll do one in diabetic macular edema. And we'll do one dealing with diabetic proliferative retinopathy. So that this is the foundation for those other three talks. Let's see here. These are my disclosures. And so I get, uh, through my university, research support from a variety of companies that we're going to discuss in terms of their treatments. How many people have heard the term evidence-based medicine? Can you raise your hand, but if you haven't heard it, don't worry about it, uh, I'm gonna talk about it. Okay, so most people have heard about it. What I wanna emphasize is that as physicians, we believe at least you'll hear by the end of the talk, that we should strive to use evidence-based medicine. It should not dictate what we do. It should be very strong science as to how we take care of patients. And evidence-based medicine means just that, evidence. It is not equal to randomized clinical trials. Randomized clinical trials are one type of evidence. There's a hierarchy of evidence. And the higher up the information is on the hierarchy, the greater it will influence or should influence how you take care of patients. So if something is way up there on the hierarchy and you're reading the literature, you wanna pay attention to that. And if you have all the time in the world you can look at the other things lower down. But they're <coughs> just high up on the hierarchy. And that's because the evidence is weaker. So for example, if you had a seven-year-old who watched some television program and told you what they learned about treating diabetic retinopathy, that's some evidence, okay? Now I would count it down here. It could be a really smart seven-year-old, but I just don't know if they took in everything, and I don't know who did the program. And so you wanna put that down there. It's evidence, but you wanna put it way down there, okay? And so if you're looking each week at medical literature for the three minutes you have to read something, and it's about somebody's television program that a seven-year-old told you about, I just put it down there. You don't have a lot of time. Now, if there's a primary outcome from a large randomized clinical trial, you wanna put that way up here. That should have a lot of influence on how you practice. And what you do is, it's only a hierarchy because the higher up on the hierarchy, the more likely the information is to truth. And you wanna take care of your patient with truth. And it doesn't mean the other stuff is made up, it just possibly isn't the truth because there could be limitations to the methods. So if you have multiple randomized clinical trials about a disease, so you're looking at how to treat endophthalmitis, and you have one randomized trial and another randomized trial and another randomized trial, all of those add up to very strong evidence, and that should influence how you treat a patient. If you have only one randomized clinical trial, that's still up there, that's right on the top line. It's just not as great as having 
multiple clinical trials that gave you the same answer. Because that one trial is pretty well designed, but even that could have been by chance alone, that it found that treatment A was perhaps better than treatment B. So if you have multiple randomized clinical trials, and you may get that by reading one and then reading another one six months later, that's where you want to put all your time because we have limited time and everything else on the hierarchy has potential faults where it may be true, it may not be true. And so when you read about it, it's fun to read about, it influences the design of clinical trials and it is evidence that should influence you. But if you're trying to determine what should you pay most attention to, what should you really sit down and take a few minutes for, it would be multiple trials. Now the next thing is systematic reviews. Some are done very well, and so you have to get a feel for what journals have very good systematic reviews. And if so, take the time and pay attention to those. Meta-analyses are important. And all of those are stronger methodologically than practice guidelines. Practice guidelines are where they invite the people you've been hearing talk to at this lecture or other people around the world, where they say, what have you learned from systematic reviews, from meta-analyses, from randomized trials, and how would you put a practice guideline together? And that's to guide you. But it doesn't have the same science, so it's not as high up. So if you only have time to read a good systematic review or someone's practice guideline, I'd go for the systematic review. It's more likely to give you truth that doesn't have bias to it. And so that's how you wanna do it. Also on the hierarchy then, are prospective case series. They're greater than retrospective case series because they have less bias in the data that were collected. It could be in a retrospective case series that somebody noticed that every one of their patients that were younger than 50 did really well with retinal detachment surgery. And so they said, I'm gonna look back at my series and see it seems that all the people under 50 are doing really well. And they look back on their series and guess what? They confirm it that all their people under 50 did really well. But that could have been by chance alone. Maybe they looked back on that series because they noticed all their people were doing well. Now if they go forward and look prospectively and say, are all my people under 50 doing well? Well, maybe that was just by chance that they did well. If it's true, it'll work on their prospective series as well. So those have potential biases. Also with prospective case series, they could be biased. Maybe all the patients that you do surgery on have a macula on detachment. You just refuse the ones that have macula off. You give that to the younger faculty member to work on and you do all the ones that have macula on, all right? But you follow them prospectively and you say, in my outcomes, I see that my patients 90% of the time end up 20, 40 or better. I must be a good retinal detachment surgeon. Or maybe I just get rid of the ones that go to the younger faculty member. And so that's why it looks better. It has nothing to do with the fact that I was the surgeon, it has to do with the fact that I only did macula on. There were confounding factors that made my series look good. Not the surgeon, but the fact that they were all macula on. And then there are case reports. Case reports are evidence, and they're okay. So when the first case was done where somebody took anti-VEGF and injected it into the eye of somebody with macular degeneration, with choroidal neovascularization, and that person went from 2200 to 2040 in a week. Well, we've never seen that before for the natural history. So that could have been just by chance, but it was more likely an important observation that was helpful. So even case reports can be helpful, but then it doesn't tell you how often it works. Was it just that one case? So besides the hierarchy, there are two principles to try to remember when you're thinking about evidence-based medicine. So they're not just about randomized clinical trials. All of them is evidence. It's just that at the top of the hierarchy are randomized clinical trials. The two guidelines to think about deal with taking the data that I'm gonna share with you and applying it to your patient. And the first is that all this evidence 
is never sufficient for you to make a clinical decision. It really depends on how it applies to that specific patient. For example, you may learn that treating diabetic macular edema when someone is 2050 does really well if you treat them with a series of injections because their vision will be better. That doesn't mean that every single patient should get that injection. What about the person who has metastatic pancreatic cancer, is on hospice care, and says, and my vision's a little blurry, and you're consulted, and you go in to see that person, and you see that they have diabetic macular edema with 20-50 vision, in addition to all their other terrible medical problems. Should you be taking the evidence that says they are better off with injections than observation or than laser and injecting them? I don't think so. Not when that person maybe has a month or two to live, you hope longer, but you don't know, but it probably wouldn't be appropriate to start to treat them because they're probably not gonna get any benefit out of it. So the evidence alone is never sufficient to make a clinical decision. You also have to consider the patient's values. So you may see a patient who has choroidal neovascularization in their first eye. Their other eye is 20-20. And it was really hard for them to come in to see you. And it would be really hard for them to get treatment for that, to come in monthly, to get treatment for their choroidal neovascularization. And they would probably have to give up taking care of their family and give up the livelihood to come in every month. And their other eye is 2020. And they work in agriculture. And they don't need to read. In fact, they don't know how to read. And they didn't even really think anything was wrong with them, but someone came by and did a screening and said, oh, this eye is 2020, this eye is 2200. They dial it, they look in, they go, oh, we're, we know what's going on. You have this wet form of macular degeneration. You have to go see our specialist that's serious, and they go see them. Doesn't mean that you should treat them. Maybe their other eye will go down the tubes as well, but maybe not. And that person is gonna to have to give up their livelihood to come in to see you. So you have to consider the patient's values as well, and they'll tell you. So decision makers, that's you, must always trade the benefits and risks, that's what you learn from the clinical trials and other evidence, and then you have to weigh the inconvenience, the costs associated with alternative managements, and you have to consider the patient's values. So there's the hierarchy of evidence. You only have a little time. Start with the randomized trials. The other is evidence as well, but if you have limited time, don't waste your time reading about it. If it's gonna change your practice, you will likely come out in a clinical trial. And if not, because it's too rare to be in a trial, it'll come out in a meta-analysis or in a practice guideline. So just rows one and two are all you have to be concerned about. You can do the other. You can read the other, you can learn about the other, but you have limited time. And then take that, and it's not sufficient to just know that evidence. You have to weigh the patient's values as well. And so it's a hierarchy of evidence because it guides, it doesn't dictate your clinical decision making. It's not a cookbook. You can't do that. And we always say being a cook is not sufficient for treating retinal diseases. Okay, so how do we interpret clinical trials? There are two main aspects I'm gonna to talk to you about, because we're only gonna talk for about 40 minutes here, 50 minutes on it, and you could read books and lectures and get master's degrees and PhDs on this, so I'm just gonna to talk to you for 50 minutes. So I'm gonna talk about two things. There's superiority trials. Is treatment A, that you read about superior treatment B. And I wanna to talk to you about how you should read about these trials, because I'm saying that's where you spend your time. And I wanna talk about how you interpret those. And then we have non-inferiority trials. First of all, that's much harder to say than superiority. And it's even harder to understand what it means. What non-inferiority trials say is, is treatment A not inferior? to treatment B. Well, that's a problem. I don't know for how many of you English is your first language. It's my first language, and I have trouble understanding that, okay? So is treatment A not inferior to treatment B? What does that mean? If treatment A is not inferior to treatment B, what it means is that treatment A is either equivalent to treatment B or 
that treatment A is superior to treatment B, but it's not inferior to treatment B. That's what it means. So it, it's either the same or it's superior, but it's for certain not inferior to treatment B. Okay, so we're gonna talk about each of those because they're both important in interpreting clinical trials. And I'm gonna give you examples when we talk about macular degeneration and when we talk about diabetic macular edema and when we talk about proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But let's start with the easier one. They're easier to design, they're easier to write about, and they're easier to interpret. And that is, is treatment A superior to treatment B? Okay? So we'll take as an example treating retinal vein occlusion, and in this case, treating a branch retinal vein occlusion first. And we'll look at, in the Bravo trial, looking at whether ranibizumab, which is Lucentis, is superior to what was our gold standard treatment at the time that it was tried. It was grid laser. But because they <clears throat> didn't want people to know whether they were getting the treatment or not, they gave them a sham injection with grid laser, or they gave them ranibizumab with fake grid laser there. And that was the design to find out if ranibizumab, not that it was equivalent to laser for vein occlusion, was it superior to macular edema from a branch retinal vein occlusion. So how do you read about this? What do you do when you see the design here? Well, the first thing you ask is, how did they determine who had this? Now in this case, if you look at the design, it says that they had a reading center confirmed eligibility. So when you read these clinical trials, you want to ask who determined who had the branch retinal vein occlusion, or let's say you read about retinal detachments, or let's say you read about macular degeneration. Who determined it? On the one hand, if you have a centralized reading center determine the disease that you're looking for, that is a branch vein occlusion with macular edema, that in this case had vision 2040 to 2400 and had on a stratus of time domain OCT thickness in the central subfield that was 250 microns or greater. When they had a reading center do that, that means that if you do this in Singapore, it's going to have the same group of people interpreting it as from India, as from Malaysia so that you have this centralized, uniform, likely determining eligibility. The downside is if you show that it works, it worked in cases where a centralized reading center determined that that doesn't work so well when you're in practice, because you're not gonna send your case to the centralized reading center. So on the one hand, it levels the playing field because it sort of equates all the doctors and their ability to meet the eligibility criteria. That's a good thing. The bad thing is it takes away the generalizability. You're less likely to apply this to your practice because you had a centralized group determine whether the treatment was superior to the other treatment. So you just wanna pay attention to that as we look at the designs. Did the centralized group determine the eligibility or did the individual practice determine it? Just tells you how much you can generalize to your practice. And then were they randomized? So if you take patients and say, oh, I'm gonna give this one sham treatment, you don't randomize it. Maybe you give sham treatment to the people you don't think are gonna do so badly. And maybe you give an active treatment to the people that you say, oh, they're gonna do badly, I better treat them. Well, that, that's not good. Then they're not equal in how they do. The sham group may end up doing better just because you entered better people in that group. So you want to randomly assign them, and you want to look at how that randomization was done. Did the doctor open up an envelope and randomize them? Or did a central computer, unrelated to the doctor or anyone else with that patient, do the randomization? And the reason you want to do that is mistakes happen, okay? You're supposed to figure out what the next person is randomly assigned to, but Maybe you open the envelope by accident ahead of time. You go, oh, that patient's not eligible. But you saw the next assignment is for sham with grid laser. And now all the next patients come in and you go, no, I don't want them to get laser. I don't want them to get laser. 
Uh, okay, this one can get laser. All right, we're going to randomly assign it. So you want to be very careful because mistakes can happen if they're randomly assigned, not purposely. I'm not talking about where the person puts the envelope up to the light and tries to see what it said, but just errors can happen. Innocent errors that the person may not even realize were wrong can happen. And so you want to make sure that the randomization was centralized. So you're reading the paper and you figure out who determined eligibility. On the one hand, it's better if it's centralized because it's more uniform. On the other hand, it's not as generalizable. And once you determine that, then you want to see where they randomized and who did the randomization. Was it sort of an independent group with a computer doing it? Or was it somebody that was just flipping the coin or opening up envelopes or what? It's better if it's independent from that, okay? And then look at how it's masked. People used to say, and in other parts of medicine, they talk about studies being blinded. We don't like to use that term because it just confuses the patient when you say, oh, you're gonna be in a double blind study. They just say you're in a double blind <laughs> study. So you have to be careful. We've just adopted the terminology, but it means double blind, and we say that it's a, it could be a double masked study. Okay, so that's, that's where that came from. And ideally, you want a double mask, ideally. Why is that? Because if the patient knows what they're getting, they may behave differently. So for the patient who is in this trial and thinks that the new injection into their eye is the best thing in the world, if they're assigned to a laser treatment, they may say, you know, they're not helping me. My uncle got laser and they didn't do so well and now I got laser and I'm not getting the new treatment and I'm not coming back. Okay, that, that wouldn't be good. They're not all treated equally. Or the person that gets the injection may say, this is that new treatment. I better try really hard when I read that eye chart. So I wanna help my doctor who I like so much and see if this will work. I mean, it just changes behaviors. And so ideally, you wanna mask the patient. Ideally, you wanna mask the doctor who's treating them. You wanna mask the doctor who's treating them because Maybe they have biases as to how it's going to work. Maybe they think that treatment A is better than treatment B. And so all the people getting treatment A, the patient walks in, they go, oh, this is really going well. You've gained two lines of vision. I'm really happy. I can't wait to see how you're doing you know, in another few months. Well, that patient's really happy. But if the doctor is biased and the next patient walks in who didn't get the new treatment, they go, oh my God, you only gained two lines. I guess you're just gonna be stuck at 2050 for a while, we'll just see what happens. Well, that's gonna change how that patient reacts as well. So ideally you don't want the doctor to know, but you can't always mask the patient. What if you're testing some surgical procedure? What if you're comparing vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage compared to injecting the eye for vitreous hemorrhage. Can you really take that patient to the operating room, fake that you're bringing them in there, fake that you're putting the ports in, or maybe put the ports in, just not turn the vitrectomy machine on, and all give them an injection. It's not practical, it's not feasible, so you have to accept, as you're reading it, that that was not double masked. Neither the patient nor the doctor were masked. And so you just put a little less confidence in the results, that's all. So look at the eligibility, look at if it was randomized, and then see was it double masked or not. <laughs> and then what's the primary endpoint? In this study, it was the mean change in visual acuity from baseline at six months. So you wanna look at a few things here for the primary endpoint. One, you wanna ask, is it a relevant endpoint for the disease? So for example, Let's say they said the primary endpoint is going to be visual field. That's a common primary endpoint for glaucoma studies where you're trying to avoid visual field loss. That would be silly in brain vein occlusion. Their visual field is not very impaired to begin with and it's not very impaired two years later and it wouldn't tell you anything. So you have to say, what's the primary endpoint that they looked at and was it relevant to the disease? And in a lot of macular diseases, it's visual acuity. In a lot of glaucoma diseases, it's visual field. And in some other diseases, it's something else. But in this case, it's visual acuity. So that was a good one. How about mean change in visual acuity? That's actually the most sensitive way of comparing 
one treatment to another for visual acuity. So there are lots of outcomes in visual acuity you could look at. You could look at the number of people that end up 2020. You could look at the number of people that end up 2200. You could look at the percent of people that gain 15 or more letters on a chart. You could look at the percent of people that lose 15 or more letters on a chart. But the most sensitive way to compare treatments for visual acuity is to look at the mean change. And that's because we measure visual acuity as a continuous variable. It's a letter score that goes from zero to 100. And whenever you have a continuous variable, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way through 100, the most sensitive way of comparing the groups is not to say what percent gained 15 or more letters. Because really, if somebody gained 14 letters, all right, that's not 15, but it's darn close, so they don't fall into that category of they gained 15 or more letters. And someone who gained 16 letters is treated like someone who gains 30 letters. They're all the same. But by using a continuous variable and looking at the mean change, that's the most sensitive way. So when you're reading papers, look at what the primary endpoint is. Is it, is it relevant to the disease? And then what do they use? If they use visual acuity, then typically mean change is the best one to use because it's a continuous variable, typically. And then look at when do they look at that primary outcome. For example, if you look in a branch vein occlusion, you say, we looked at the mean change in visual acuity. I just told you that's a good one. And we looked at it a week later. I'm not sure that's so good. First of all, your treatment may not be working by then, and your control group's not gonna change in a week by then. So when did they look at it? Is it relevant to the disease? Maybe they looked at it six months, maybe a year. What if they said, we're gonna look at it 20 years later? Well, that's not very relevant to that person. What's happening over six months and a year and, and five years and 10 years? Their, their, their vision is important. So look at the primary endpoint by what they chose and at what time point they chose. And then you wanna ask, okay, what was the control group or what was any rescue treatment? In this case, the ranibizumab group was allowed to get laser only starting at month three, and the sham group was allowed to get this laser, but only starting at month three, and only under certain circumstances. So does that make sense? Yes, it does. Because the way we treated with laser in the past for branch vein occlusion is we recognize that some cases just get better on their own. And so there isn't an emergency to treat them. And so you'd want to give them an opportunity to see if they get better on their own, and that's why this was designed that way. So that's an okay control group. That was our standard care. See if they get better on their own, and if not, then add laser if it's not getting better on its own. <coughs> After you look at the design, and that is, what's the primary outcome? Did they randomize them? Was it masked? And what was the time point for that? Then you should find a table of baseline characteristics. Now I'm gonna give you a quick clue to tell is it a really good write-up of the trial or is it just okay? And the clue is when they looked at their baseline characteristics, did they have a column of p-values to look at whether one group was different from another group? Okay, did they have a column of p-values? I don't have one here, but we'll come back to that. So how many think it would be good to have p-values to see if one group differed from the other? Just raise your hand. There's no right answers here, but how many think that having a p-value would be good? Okay, now you have to vote, okay? If you don't vote, then I start coming around and call on you, okay? Now, how many people think you shouldn't have a p-value when you're comparing this? Okay, so some people didn't vote, so now you're in trouble. Okay, we're gonna do it one more time. <laughs> How many people, you won't, yeah, it's a forced vote. You either want the p-value column or you don't. It's not, it's not an option, okay? How many want p-value column on here to compare if the sham group has, for example, more men than the 0.5 randomizer group? How many want a p-value to compare that? Just raise your hand, okay. And how many don't want to, that, that, how, who, right, who didn't raise their hand? Okay, okay, you win. All right, you don't want a p-value. That's a clue to see how well the write-up is. Okay, why not? Because the p-value tells you whether they're different, 
okay? But it's influenced by the number of cases you look at. So if you have 10 people in each group, and there's seven women in one group, and three women in the other group, the p-value, I can guarantee you, will be greater than 0.05. You won't see that there's necessarily a statistical difference among 10 people in each group, where seven out of 10 in one group were women and three out of 10 in another group were women. P-value there will be 0.4, okay? Now, if you have 10,000 people in one group and 10,000 people in another group, and you have 5,100 in the first group that are men, and you have 4,900 in the other group that are men, I can guarantee it's gonna be like a p-value of 0 0.0001. But they're not really different. It's just that there's 10,000 of them. So the p-value is dependent on the difference you see and the number that you looked at. So that doesn't tell you if it's relevant in terms of balance. We wanna balance them because if they're not balanced, then it might change the outcome. What if everybody does well with this treatment if they start at 2040? Then you wanna make sure that they're balanced in the number of people who are 2040. But what you have to do is eyeball the chart and say, do I see imbalances and how big is it? And if it eyeballs, like there's a likely big difference because you only have 50 people, then you might have to adjust in your analyses for that imbalance. But if there's a difference that you see and there's hundreds of people in the trial, then we don't think it's likely different. So there's 56% that are men versus 50% in the 0.3 milligram group. I'll bet if you did a p-value among 130 in each arm that that would be different. It's probably not relevant to this. It's a relatively small difference that we see, but it's probably, probably gonna come out as a statistically significant difference. It's just not likely to influence the results. When you look at the baseline characteristics of a trial looking at the treatment of a retinal disease that involves the macula, where visual acuity is the outcome, the most important thing that you want to have balanced is the visual acuity. So you want to make sure there's a baseline characteristic table. That's number one. You want to make sure that they're balanced by looking at that. And you want to see if there's a p-value column. That will tell you they're only okay at doing clinical trials. They probably designed a great one, but they didn't realize the error that I just told you. And then what you want to do is look to see if the visual acuities are balanced. If they are, that's good. And that means that you're likely okay when you do the analysis. If the visual acuities are not balanced, they're gonna to have to adjust their analysis for that imbalance. Usually by luck, with enough patients enrolled, like 130 in each arm here, they'll be balanced, and they were. So the visual acuity letter score, remember it goes from zero to 100, was 55, 56, and 53. Those are really close to each other. They're not exactly the same. They're really close to each other. And I gave you the Snellen equivalent there, and so that's pretty balanced. Another thing that might influence the outcome when you're talking about edema is what the central subfield thickness was. And so you wanna know if they're balanced. Here they may not be balanced. There may be a little imbalance there. So you might say, okay, we might have to adjust for the central subfield thickness when our statisticians do the analysis. But those are the two things you wanna look at when you're looking at these diseases. First of all, do they have a baseline characteristic table to see if they're balanced across? even though randomization is supposed to balance them, this confirms that you didn't have bad luck in that. So that's the first thing you look for, the baseline characteristic. Okay, the next thing is, did they adhere to your treatment? You said you were gonna treat them six times in the first six months. That was the design of the trial. That doesn't mean people did it. Maybe after that first injection, the person said, oh, not me. I'm not gonna have that done. Well, that makes it harder to interpret. And maybe all the people that got shammed said, oh, that didn't hurt, I'm fine. And all the people that got injected said, that hurt, I'm not gonna come back to do that. So you wanna make sure, did they adhere to the protocol you said? And in this case, they did. They were supposed to all get six injections. The average came out to 5.6, because just about everybody, or half of the people, half of the people missed one injection over the six months. 
that, that was balanced among all those cases, okay? And then in terms of receiving this rescue laser beyond three months, that wasn't balanced, but that's not a baseline characteristic. That was dependent on do they meet certain rescue criteria. So you wanna just confirm that the person followed the protocol, okay? Now the primary results. So this was the mean change from baseline, 7.3, 16.6, and 18.3. And you look to see, is that a statistically significant difference? And the answer is yes. So, so far, you have a very sensitive way of saying these are different. That doesn't mean that it's clinically relevant. That just means that we're confident the outcome on the visual acuity at six months is different. Okay, so that was step one. Now the reason we don't know if it's clinically relevant is you can't just look at this, let's say the 0.3 milligram ranibizumab and say, gee, that's nine letters better than the sham group. That doesn't mean that each and every patient was nine letters better. That's just the average for the group. So let's say this side got sham and this side got 0.3 milligrams. Well, this has got an average to 7.3. So maybe you gained 15 and you lost three and you gained seven, and you lost two, and you gained 14, and you lost five, and you add them all up, and the average is 7.3, and you do the same thing over here. So I can find someone over here who gained 15, and somebody lost three here, I can find someone over here who lost three, but when you average them out, there were more people here who only gained a little, and more people here who gained more, and so on average, the difference was nine letters between them. But to know if it's clinically relevant, you have to look at secondary outcomes to say, did that translate to a clinically relevant outcome? Were there more people over here, for example, that gained three or more lines of vision from 2080? Because going three or more lines improved from 2080 is going to 2040 or better. And if you have more people here that went from 2080 to 2040 or better than over here, then even though there's only a nine letter difference in the averages, it may come out to a clinically relevant difference. And so you look at those outcomes as well. So they did. They said, how many people then gained 15 or more letters? And they found out that it was greater in the two ranibizumab groups than in the control group. Okay. So now we looked at the design of the study. We knew who was eligible. We know that they randomly assigned them. We knew that it was double masked. And then on top of that, they had baseline characteristics, they looked balanced, and then we look at the primary outcome, which made sense. It was a mean change, it's the most sensitive way of comparing them, and guess what? It ended up being different. So then they said, well, let's see if it's clinically relevant. So as a secondary outcome, they looked at who gained 15 or more letters from baseline at six months, and that tells us that that worked very well. Now, they looked at OCT retinal thickness, and that went down more in the ranibizumab group. That doesn't tell you it works. That only tells you what happened on the OCT. And what happens with central subfield thickness is correlated with the visual acuity, but that doesn't tell you for certain that they did better. What if you had taken laser and just burned their retina? You know who would have a thinner retina? The ones that you burn. So just because the retina is thinner doesn't mean that it's acting better. But on average, it might be correlated with that. So this gave greater confidence as a secondary outcome. It reassured us that the visual acuity that we measured was confirmed on an associated variable that is measured just by a computer, not by a person reading a chart. And then they looked at safety outcomes and they barely saw any safety problems among the 265 people, not the sham, but the 265 people that got ranibizumab. Now let's look at another. Now you're really good. So we're gonna look at using a Flebercept for central vein occlusion. And there were two trials that looked at that, Copernicus and Galileo. They differed by how they treated the people beyond six months, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. I'm just trying to show you how we look at it. So we look at the design of the study. It was well designed in terms of randomly assigned mass to what they were getting. And now the first thing is you look at the baseline characteristics. And what's the first thing you look at in the baseline characteristics? When you're looking at these, anybody? What's that? Patient number is more in the in the two Q four group, 
because they wanted to look at safety issues and they wanted to expose more to that. They needed at least 70 in each group to likely find a difference. So it is interesting that the number is different, but that's why we look at the percentages to see if those are balanced. But the first thing we look at is some other people said is the visual acuity. Is the visual acuity balanced, okay? So here it's 49 versus 50 for the letter score. That's 2100. That's balanced there. It's balanced in Galileo as well. So we're feeling pretty good that the randomization worked. And it is interesting, as you said, that there were more people in the Cleaver set group, but that's because they wanted to expose more people to that. So they were looking at a way of evaluating safety at the same time that they were randomly assigning people. So they were being efficient and tricky uh, with their design, okay? And no p-values, okay? So they know what they were doing. All right, patient disposition. Did they all come back? So what do you see here in terms of the sham group versus the 2Q4 group in terms of coming back for follow-up? What's that? Is it the same? No, okay, it's different. So that's a problem. So the first thing you look at is where they balance. The second thing you look at is, did they come back? Okay, and do they equally come back? And ideally, 100% come back, that never happens. People get sick, people move, problems happen in families, somebody might die. And so here you see, ideally you want that to be the same in both groups, not the number, because as was pointed out, the ends are different, the percentages, okay? But now we have a problem, because more people dropped out in the sham group. What's that going to do to the visual acuity that we measure in terms of the outcome at six months? That more of the sham people dropped out. Any guesses? Is the visual acuity likely going to be better or worse? Well, what it depends on is how the analysis handles missing data. You don't want any data missing. We usually manage it in some way. But however you manage it, it's just a guess. The simplest way that people manage it sometimes is they say, well, whenever they dropped out, I'm gonna freeze the visual acuity right there because I don't know what happened, and I'm just gonna carry it forward. That's last observation, carry forward. Well, what if you have a disease like central vein occlusion with macular edema, and the longer you have it, the more deterioration there is in your vision in the first year? Well, if people drop out at one or two months, and they were 2100 and they dropped to 2125, you'll never see if they drop to 2160 or 2200, because you froze them when they dropped out, you just carry that forward. Now, because this happened in the sham group, if anything, they should have better visions. It makes it harder for the treatment group to improve. But if you had a disease where they naturally get better with time, okay, then you might miss that, and you might freeze the visual acuity at a time it was bad. Let's take a vitreous hemorrhage. Many of those clear over time. So if people drop out while you're waiting to see if their vitreous hemorrhage clears, and you freeze their vision at, let's say, 2400 before it really cleared, then you're gonna have a bad comparison to the other group where they had 95% follow-up and that you actually have their vision at six months as to what's going on. So it's a big problem if you lose people to follow because you don't know how to adjust their vision. A simple way is last observation carried forward. But it's even a bigger problem if you lost people and you only lost them in one group because then you have this bias between one group and another. So that's a challenge. Well, they had another study and again, at 24 weeks, they had 90% of the Afflibercept group and 80% of the sham group who came back. That's a problem. So maybe the people weren't doing well. It's, this is a harder disease. The first disease I showed you was a branch vein occlusion. This was macular edema from a central vein occlusion. And when people aren't doing well, they're not getting better. Maybe they dropped out, went across the street and said, I want that new treatment. I know it's available for macular degeneration, just, just give it to me. So they, they lost people. I don't know why they lost people. They gave various reasons, you can see here. Withdrawal of consent, 
protocol deviation, maybe that means they went across the street and got treated. Adverse event, maybe that's they said I, I was not improving, and then they went across the street. Death, you can't do anything about. But that was just very few. Loss to fall, I don't know what that means. Maybe they went across the street and got treated. Treatment failure, I don't know what that means. Maybe the doctor decided to treat them. So there's a differential here, and that should just give you less confidence in the results. It doesn't mean that the results don't count. It's just that you're gonna have less confidence when you have loss to follow, especially differential loss to follow. So that's a problem, that's a problem. Okay, nevertheless, their primary endpoint were the proportion of patients who gained 15 or more letters. That's good, it was at six months, that's when a lot of change happens. We would have rather it be mean change in visual acuity because that's a more sensitive way of comparing groups and then secondarily, looking at the percentage that gained 15 or more letters. But it could be because of regulatory designs or demands of the government that's going to approve the agent that they had to go for this. That's not the ideal from a scientific standpoint. It might have been the ideal from a regulatory standpoint. And it still showed that it was beneficial. So it's an important secondary outcome. The reason it doesn't tell you everything is the following. What you can see here is that only 12% in the Copernicus trial, for example, gained 15 or more letters. 56% gained 15 or more letters in the Aplibersec group. Can you hypothesize any reason why this outcome isn't as good as if we looked at the mean change? Is there any possible way it didn't happen in this trial, I'll tell you. But is there any possible way where this may not tell the whole story? Any guesses? No, this tells the whole story, it's okay. And why did I wanna use the mean change? How many people that were assigned to a plebiscept here lost 30 or more letters of vision? Do you know? You don't know, because that's included in the mean. You take the gains, the losses, and everything else. But in this outcome, which said how many people got 15 or more letter better, that's all you know, how many got 15 or more letter better. What if that other 40% all lost 30 letters? Just make believe it didn't happen, okay? But you don't know from this. And make believe no one lost 30 or more letters in the shampoo. Well, that's important to know, because then you would say to the patient, well, I can't get you better if I leave you alone, but you won't lose any vision versus, well, I can give you something that 60% of the time you'll get better and 40% of the time you're gonna do disastrously. And they'd have to weigh that and decide what they wanna do. Well, that didn't happen, okay? So very few people in both groups lost substantial vision. But that's why we don't like an isolated outcome like this, ideally for visual acuity. We'd rather start with the mean, and just because the mean came out doesn't mean it's relevant, it just tells you that we're confident they're different because it takes the gains and the losses and everything in between. And then, secondarily, we look at the visual acuity that gained 15 or more letters if the means are different. Now, in this case, you could look at the 15 or more letter gain, they can say, well, let's see how many people lost 15 or more letters. And then let's see how many gained between 10 and 15, and let's see how many lost between 10 and 15. And let's see how many gained between zero and 10, and how many lost between zero and 10. But eventually, you're, what you're doing is you're just getting the mean. If you're gonna look at all those various combinations. And that's why the mean is the most sensitive way of doing it. And it tells you the whole story, not just the gains, not just the losses, when you're looking at a central disease like this. Now, disease is very, I'm just talking about in vein occlusion, that's the most sensitive way. It might not be allowed by the regulatory folk that were looking at it. So they did for their secondary from the mean change. That takes into account the gains and the losses. And now we know that that theory that I told you didn't happen because you have the same number of people here gaining in both groups and the control group does not have any gain. It's just sort of stable there. So we know by implication there couldn't have been more losses in the treatment group than in the control group. And this looks at different cuts of the data. So we already talked about the primary outcome, which was gaining 15 or more letters. 
But then as a secondary outcome, they looked at who gained 10 or more letters, who gained 30 more letters. But another thing that they did, when you look at these trials, that's of no value, we think, is looking at this, who gained zero or more letters. Why is that of no value? Because when you're 2100, let's say that's a letter score of 50. If you walk out of here and come back in to measure it again, and it measures 51, do you think that person gained vision for real? Or do you think they just got one more letter on the chart because there's gonna be some human variability in that? I think all they did was walk out and get a cup of coffee and come back in. I think that that 51 is no different than the 50, but this would say it is different, okay? And that's why when you look at these dichotomous outcomes, you wanna take ones that you know are real changes. In this case, 10 or more letters is probably a real change when you're 2100. When you're 2200 or worse, if that's where people started, it's not where they started here. When you're 2200, then losing 15 or more letters is probably real. But if you just lost nine or 10 letters, that may not be real. That just may be variability when you're as bad as 2200. And we have data that tell us how reproducible is a visual acuity. When you're 2032, plus or minus a couple letters is real. When you're 2100, plus or minus 10 letters is probably real. When you're 2200, plus or minus 15 letters is probably real. When you're 2400, plus or minus 30 letters is probably real. And anything less than that may be real, or it may just be variability because of the disease. So you have to keep in mind what the outcomes are that they're looking at. And they looked, and this gave us confidence again, of secondary outcomes anatomically that help in terms of the visual acuity. So that's superiority trials. Okay, now a little harder one because it, it takes all those things we talked about. Was it randomized? Was it masked? What are the baseline characteristics? Was there loss to follow? All of that in a superiority trial, you wanna look for in a non-inferiority trial. But the outcome is what's different in a non-inferiority trial. When you're trying to show is treatment A not inferior to treatment B, why would you be trying to show that something's not inferior? Because you think it has other advantages. So maybe you have a drug to treat macular degeneration that lasts six months. Wouldn't that be great? Okay, so it would be great if you only had to come in for an injection every six months, but not if the vision dropped to 2400 when you used it. It would only be great if the visual acuity came out at least the same, if not better, than when you give monthly treatment. So you do a non-inferiority trial when the most important outcome you think would just like to be the same. And there are other reasons that you wanna show that this treatment may be non-inferior. Maybe you use it less often, maybe it costs less, maybe it's safer. But you're hoping that at least the visual acuity is the same, if not better. And if you prove it's non-inferior, if you prove it's not inferior, then it's either the same or it's better. It's just not inferior, okay? So that's why we also have, in clinical trials, non-inferiority trials, okay? So here's how those work. Let's say you do have anti-VEGF A or B, and you're trying to show that A and B, let's say, are not or let's say A is not inferior to B, okay? So if they're exactly the same, let's say you're gonna look at the mean change in vision from baseline to one year. I already told you that's a good outcome to look at because it's very sensitive to take all the gains, all the losses, put it all together. So you're gonna look at the mean change that you get from baseline to one year with anti-VEGF A, the mean change from B, they come out exactly the same, they come out to zero because the difference between the gains in A and the gains in B, if they're exactly the same, they'll come out to zero, okay? So let's take an example. So you use anti-VEGF A, and the mean change from baseline to one year is nine letters. And you use anti-VEGF B, and the mean change in the group from baseline to one year is 8.9. So which one's better? A is better. Only by 0.1 letters, but it's better, okay? Now, do you care that it differed by 0.1 letters? Well, you have a lot of experience measuring visual acuity and you realize that a mean change between this group and that group of 0.1 letters is 
probably not relevant. So it's real, perhaps, but it's just not relevant. So you say, okay, maybe that's equivalent. Maybe that's not really different. It's not zero, but maybe it's not different. Now you do another one. So anti-VEGF A, they gain 27 letters from baseline. And the mean change from baseline in anti-VEGF B, they gain nine letters, the difference of 18 letters in the mean. So you add up this group, they gain 27. You add up this group, you didn't do as well this time. You gain nine. So this group didn't do as well as here. And the difference was 18 letters. Would you rather have this treatment? Probably, because that's a big difference. So the first thing you have to decide is, okay, I have a difference of 0.1, or I have a difference of 18. At, you said 0.1 is probably not different. You said 18 letters probably is different. Where do you draw the line? Is it 0.2? Is it 17? Is it 0.5? Is it 16? Is it one letter? Is it 14? Is it two letters? Is it 13? Where do you draw the line? When do you say it's equivalent? And when do you say it's not equivalent? So you first, in designing a non-inferiority trial, have to decide when it's equivalent and when it's not equivalent. Not just zero, because to call point one not equivalent, that just doesn't make sense. And so you have to decide where you're gonna decide that it's gonna be. For macular degeneration, people decided five letters. When you look at the mean of one and the mean of the other, you look at the difference, that anything beyond five we can't call equivalent. Everything in between, we would call equivalent. Where'd that come from? Well, the boundary of the equivalency comes from expert opinion looking at previous trials of the disease. So when the macular degeneration trials were being designed, they looked back at laser for macular degeneration, they looked back at photodynamic therapy for macular degeneration, and looked at the first anti-VEGF given, pegaptinib or macrogen. And they looked at the treatment group. In all of these, they lost vision. That's why the anti-VEGFs are so much better. But these were superior treatments because the control group lost even more vision. And the delta, the difference between the treatment group and the control group, always was about six or seven. And everybody adopted those treatments. They said, I think it's worthwhile. That mean change translated to enough people that gained 15 or more letters in one group versus the other to say a mean change of six or seven is probably a real difference. And based on that, the experts around the world that studied this said, you know what? We're going to call five the equivalent boundary. Not one, not two, not ten, but five based on this. And that was a reasonable decision. So that's the first step in a non-inferiority trial. What is your boundary of equivalence? So you have to look that up. You have to read the methods to see when they're trying to show, is treatment A not inferior to treatment B? The first thing is, where do they draw the equivalent lines, okay? Now, you do treatment A, it comes out to seven. You do treatment B, it comes out to six. The difference is one letter. Is that treatment B non-inferior to treatment A? Well, you're not done. You're not done because so there's one more step in a non free R trial. First, you have to have the boundaries, but the second step is you have to look at the point estimate and the confidence interval around it. That depends on how many people you enrolled. If you enrolled 1,000 in A and 1,000 in B, we're pretty confident that that one letter is equivalent. And the confidence interval around that one letter difference with 1,000 people in each group would probably be minus one letter plus or minus 0.05 letters. I mean, it would just be still within that range. But you have to make sure that the lower bounds of the confidence interval doesn't cross your boundaries of equivalence. So in this case, when it was about 100 people, the difference of six letters, the difference was minus one plus or minus two letters. So we're 95% confident that treatment B is no worse than three letters from treatment A. And we already decided if, it, if it's less than five, they're essentially equivalent. It's like that point one. So you have to look at the point estimate, and then depending on the size of the study, that gives you the confidence interval, and you say, what's the worst it could be? I'm pretty confident it's no worse than minus three here. And that's within my boundary, so I'm done. So the first step is the boundary. 
The second step is what's the result and the confidence interval around the result, and what's the lower bounds of that confidence interval? Did it cross your equivalency or not? So this is equivalent. How about this one? Plus seven, plus three, but this was only 50 people in each group. So the confidence interval about minus four wasn't plus or minus two letters, it was plus or minus three letters. It went down to as low as minus seven. And that crossed the boundary, so we cannot say that B is non-inferior to A. B might be equivalent, the point estimate's equivalent, but it might be worse. And so non-inferior means it's either equivalent or superior, but it can't be inferior. And this crosses the boundary there. How about this example? Here it came out to seven for treatment A, treatment B gained 3.5. The difference is minus 3.5, that's the X here, that's the point estimate. But now, you only did about 35 people in each group. It was plus or minus four letters. So that minus 3.5 went to as low as minus 7.5. All right, that crossed our boundary, it's not equivalent. But it went as high as plus 1.5 or 0.5. And so this is an inconclusive result. It might be equivalent, it might be superior, it might be inferior to treatment A. We just don't know, but it's not non-inferior. So when you look at a non-inferior trial, you do all those things I tell you for a superiority trial. How they design it, do they have a, a good primary endpoint, do they pick a good time of it, do they mask it? And then you have to ask, did they set it up correctly? What was their equivalency? Was it a reasonable amount? In this disease, five would be reasonable, and I told you why. Not three, not 0.1, not 27, but five. And then you look at the result, and you look at where it crossed the boundary there. So this is just to show you, now you'll understand this. This was the main result in the CAP trial that looked at bevacizumab compared with ranibizumab. <coughs> And they wanted to show that the visual acuity was non-inferior because bevacizumab cost less. And I said, well, if it costs less, should I use it? Well, maybe, not if everyone goes blind, but maybe yes, if the visual acuity was non-inferior. So this was their main outcome. Now, what is this? Well, first of all, you can see the zero line there. That's if they came out exactly the same. And there's our boundary. So now you understand these graphs that they had. And these were the six different analyses that they did. And they didn't look at a 95% confidence interval, they looked at a 97.5 confidence interval because they had to do a wider confidence interval because they did six comparisons. So 95% is just for one comparison, but the more you do, the more you have to adjust your confidence interval. And the little yellow line in the middle of the blue bar, that's the point estimate. Those are the X's I was showing you previously. And the bar is the confidence interval. And as long as that confidence interval doesn't cross that red line, then indeed treatment B is non-inferior to treatment A. And in this case, you can see in four out of the six comparisons, it was non-inferior. In two of them, it wasn't. And it's very important to think about those. These were the six that were done. Four of them were equivalent or non-inferior. And two of them were inconclusive. They're either equivalent or they might be inferior because they crossed that line. And we just don't know. So you'd have to tell the patient, well, this treatment costs less and it might give you the same vision or it might be worse for you. That's what those two say. Now those two were very important. They were PRN bevacizumab versus every four week bevacizumab and PRN bevacizumab versus every four week Ranibizumab. So when we look at PRN ranibizumab versus every four week ranibizumab, that was good. PRN meant they came in every month for two years. That wasn't so good. We'll discuss this tomorrow in a little more detail. But you didn't have to treat them every month. And so that was an advance. You had non-inferior vision by treating them as needed. And you didn't have to treat them every month. You had to see them every month. And so the impact was if you're gonna get ranibizumab, you could consider seeing them every month, but just dosing when it was needed as per the protocol that described when it was needed. And this was interesting. It showed that if you give bevacizumab every month, it's the same as giving ranibizumab every month, or at least it was equivalent. 
So that was good. It didn't get out of seeing them monthly, and it didn't get out of treating them monthly. Here we got out of treating them monthly because PRN ranibizumab was equivalent to every four-week ranibizumab. Here you had to treat them monthly and see them monthly. But this was a problem. PRN bevacizumab was not non-inferior. It failed non-inferiority compared to every four week brand of this map. So the impact is if you're gonna give bevacizumab, you could give it every four weeks for two years, and you'd be confident that you'd get non-inferior vision to ran this map every four, four weeks. But if you gave PRN bevacizumab, you couldn't be confident that it would be equivalent to giving ran map monthly. And these are the results at one year, and that bottom row is that non is that failure to have uh, non inferiority? The top row is ranibizumab every four weeks, and that bottom one is bevacizumab as needed. With each one, they were a little worse, and there was concern because between 36 and 52 weeks, it started going downhill in that PRN bevacizumab. People said, "Well, what's going to happen in two years? Maybe that was just a fluke." It wasn't a fluke. It kept going down. So by two years, we're even more confident that if you give bevacizumab as needed, it is not gonna be equivalent to ranibizumab monthly. But if you give ranibizumab as needed, we are confident that it's equivalent or non-inferior to ranibizumab monthly, okay? So in summary to all of this, and then we'll take a couple of questions. In summary to all this, you want to look at the eligibility criteria, the randomization, whether it was masked, what are the baseline characteristics, no p-values, please. And you'll have to manage if you think that they're imbalanced. Did the patients come back, or how did they manage the loss to follow-up? Did they adhere to the protocol? What was the primary outcome, and was it at a clinically relevant time? Is it, is, does it make sense for the disease? And typically, mean change with a continuous vision variable like best corrected visual acuity, or a continuous variable like mean sensitivity loss on the visual field are good primary outcomes. But there are some situations where it warrants having a dichotomous outcome. Maybe you're trying to have everybody be 20, 20 or better as a dichotomous outcome if you're testing, for example, refractive surgery. And we didn't discuss this, but we will tomorrow, about pre-planned pre -planned subgroup interactions, and that's only done if the primary outcome is met, and I'll discuss that tomorrow. And secondary outcomes should be at the time of the primary outcome and beyond that as well, and they help confirm if your primary outcome is indeed clinically relevant. And they also give you sometimes independent support of the primary outcome, and you're gonna look at safety. Now there are some special aspects of a non-inferiority trial you have to look at what the boundary is and what's the lower bounds of the 95% confidence interval, not the point estimate difference. What's the 95% confidence interval around the difference and did that lower bound cross your non-inferiority margin? That's how you look at those studies. It's not the point estimate, it's the confidence interval and whether that crossed the bound there. And then finally, Something that we'll discuss tomorrow about macular degeneration is beware of non-inferiority drift from the gold standard. What's that mean? Let's say B is non-inferior to your gold standard A, like PRN ranibizumab is non-inferior to monthly ranibizumab. Let's say C is non-inferior to A. Monthly bevacizumab is non-inferior to monthly ranibizumab. Let's say D is non-inferior to B, okay? So PRN bevacizumab, that's D, is indeed non-inferior to PRN ranibizumab. That's B, I told you B is non-inferior to A. But what non-inferiority drift means is as you keep comparing one that was non-inferior to the other, and you have another one that's non-inferior to that first one that was non-inferior, well you may get to a point where this non-inferiority is actually inferior to the gold standard, and that's what happened here. It doesn't mean that D is non-inferior to A, that PRN bevacizumab is not non-inferior to monthly ranibizumab. So maybe the same or maybe inferior to monthly ranibizumab. And that's what we mean by non-inferiority drift. And you'll see that as you read about clinical trials. So you're the decision maker. You have to weigh the benefits and risks that's typically in these randomized trials. If not in a systematic review, maybe in a practice guideline. So look for those. And that's where you want to spend most of your time. 
All the other things are evidence as well, but they may be biased. They may have weaknesses to them. Even these trials can be biased and have weaknesses to them. And you have to take this information and weigh that with the cost and convenience, benefits and risks, and consider the patient's values. Because as I said, it's a guide, not a cookbook. It's not sufficient to be able to treat rat diseases just by being a cook. Thank you very much. And we can take a couple questions on that before we roll into being macular degeneration. Anybody? Don't be shy. Okay. Yes? How are the imbalances corrected? How are the imbalances corrected? Depends on what the imbalance is. And what you have to do is you have to do a very complex adjustment by trying to weigh the subgroup of how those people did. So let's say you're in balance because you have more people in treatment A that are 20, 50 or better than in treatment B. You have to look at those outcomes and weight the analysis by what those differences were. It is a very complex mathematical design. It, it exists, I mean, it's not a secret as to how to do it, but that's the, that's the basis behind the black box of doing it. But what you want to make sure of is that they said that they adjusted it. You could check the math if you want to and say, you know, show me how you adjusted for those imbalances. But basically, it's a mathematical adjustment weighing the results differently rather than just straight out comparing one versus the other. Yeah. In case of a disease which is uh, known to have a good uh, clinical natural history, and we have a newer treatment for that disease, which probably gives a 100% result in comparison to a 50%, which is a natural history, and also it hastens the recovery. And if we want to do a comparative analysis, is it necessary to include the natural history patients also, or that can be kind of a uh, taken uh, as per the what is the given literature, and we just proceed with our study of the newer treatment modality. Yeah, there are innumerable examples in the history of medicine where the way the natural history worked at one point in time differed from the next point in time. I'll give you a few examples, and that's why you don't want to use historical controls. When people had macular holes. There was no surgery for them. And so when people operated on macular holes when they first came out, the average vision following the surgery was about 2080. But that's because they walked in at 2200 on average, so a lot of people didn't do so well. Now as we recognize that there was surgery that could be done for macular holes, people recognized them and they were 2040, 2032. So they started operating on them. So they, the outcomes were very different. And so if you use these historical controls with your new treatment, I've got a new drug I'm gonna inject. It's called AIR, and it makes the whole close. You don't wanna compare it to your controls because that control group may have changed. The way that people pick up macular holes now when you're testing your AIR injection, your gas vitriolysis, that may be different now when people are identifying them. So you're actually testing it on a different cohort than what you thought the natural history was. So that you're always in danger of using a natural history group, even though you think that it's very good. Maybe it's a different group that's being identified now to do that. So ideally, you don't want to do that. And if you do do that, you just want to look at it and have skepticism as to whether it's really better because the control group that you're comparing it to may not apply to the present day, even though it was done just a year ago. Some of these studies, they uh, actually randomize not one is to one, or sometimes it's one is to two, or one is sure. to three. Now, uh, what's the basis for that? Why do they want to look at it? So the basis, and then the, the study that they pointed out with Copernicus uh, and uh, was doing that as well. What you first figure out is how many in my control group do I need to see if my new treatment group is superior? So maybe you figure out that the way this disease works, the variability of change from baseline to one year determines how many you're going to need. 
And let's just say you need 150 in each group, just based on whatever the retinal disease was. And there are tables to figure this out based on historical controls, how you think they're going to do. They don't always do that, but how you think they're going to do. That determines how many you'll need in each group to, to confidently say A is better than B, not just by luck from a few people, but by sampling a lot of, enough people that you'll have that. All right, so 150 in each group. Now, the Singapore Drug Association says we're only gonna approve this if you've exposed at least 300 people to the drug. You only need 150 to show if A is better than B. But you say, you know what I'm gonna do? I have to expose 300 people to this. I only need 150. I'm gonna randomly assign two people to the drug for every one person to the control group so that I'll not only know is treatment A superior to treatment B, I'll have the safety on treatment A to present to the regulatory authorities or just to yourself if you think that you wanna be confident. If you have 300 people, okay, then if you show that there were no safety problems at all, you're 95% confident okay, that there's less than 1% chance that you miss, let's say, retinal detachments or something like that. So by having a large enough number, the 95% confidence in around zero, or one event or two events, becomes pretty small. And so that's why you might, as an example, you might up the rate. You might do it for psychological reasons. You might think that it'll be easier to enroll people psychologically if I tell them that, well, three out of four people will get the new treatment. So you might have seen that the New England Journal of Medicine just showed that a combination of two different checkpoint inhibitor drugs lengthened life in metastatic melanoma to the brain substantially by, you know, like eight months. That's really huge. That's why it made the headlines this week. Well, can you imagine if you want to get into that trial, you're dying of metastatic melanoma to the brain Maybe psychologically, you're more likely to enter that if you hear, well, my odds are three out of four that I'm gonna get this new treatment. Now, the new treatment may fail. There's examples of checkpoint inhibitors being worse for the person, but the patient doesn't recognize that in the emotion of having this metastasis to their brain, for example. So there could be other reasons as well, but the safety one is a good one that, that, that might be there. And usually, the statistical analysis plan should describe why they're doing it, okay? And that's another thing you want to look for. Besides the p-value column, when the randomized trial is published, see if they put online as a supplement, did they put the protocol out there? And did they put the statistical analysis plan? That will give you an idea if they're really sharing everything that needs to be shared. And that's the responsibility of the journal to do that as well. But you want to see if it's there. OK, so I think, I think I have the right program. We're doing the next talk right away for 45 minutes, is that right? And we'll yeah. end at 3.45? Yeah. I don't want to abuse you, I just want to get it right. Yes, they said right. Okay, here we go.